All right, what's up, Facebook? I am live. Prophet David Taylor here for your weekly live prophetic word. So let's say a word of prayer and let's jump right on in. Thank you, Lord, for this day. Thank you for your kindness. Thank you that your mercy endures forever. Thank you that you are truly a good God. Lord, I surrender myself to you, O God. I must decrease so that you might increase. So breathe through me, speak through me. Fill me with the Holy Ghost, O God. Breathe through my mouth and my hand gestures. I surrender everything to you, O God, so that you might communicate what you want communicated this day to the honor and the glorification of your name, that the saints might be edified and the sinners might be challenged to turn from their own way and to turn to you. For truly, you are a good God, worth knowing, worth loving, and worth serving. We thank you for it. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, amen and amen. Today's prophetic word, oh, there's my sister. Say hi to my sister. Hey, sis. Today's prophetic word is hidden treasure. Today's prophetic word is hidden treasure. Now, I've ministered on this before, but there's going to be some new things that the Spirit of God shows us today that we haven't seen before. So let's look at our scripture foundation. Okay. Our first scripture, scripture foundation is Matthew 13, 44. Matthew 13, 44. So let me put that on the screen. Matthew 13, 44. Okay. When I say put it on the screen, for those of you that are listening to the podcast, I'm talking about my Facebook Live and those of you on Periscope. Uh, when I put the scriptures up on the screen, I'm doing that through StreamYard on Facebook Live. Okay, when you watch the replay on YouTube, the scriptures will also be on the screen there. Okay. Matthew 13, 44. Now, I did it no more genies on this because I went through all the times where Jesus said the kingdom of heaven is like this, the kingdom of heaven is like that. And when the Lord talks about what the kingdom of heaven is like. Matthew 13, 44 says, New International Version, the kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field. When a man found it, he hid it again, and then in his joy went and sold all he had and bought that field. New Living Translation, the kingdom of heaven is like a treasure that a man discovered hidden in a field. In his excitement, he hid it again and sold everything he owned to get enough money to buy the field. Uh, Berean Study Bible, the kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field. When a man found it, he hid it again, and in his joy, he went and sold all he had and bought that field. So the English translations are uh, pretty straightforward, but what does that mean for us today? What is, what is the Lord talking about when he's talking about the kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field? Okay, first of all, uh, I talked about it before. When you see that word kingdom in English, it means property or properly, excuse me, it means properly royalty. It means rule or realm. One more time. It means properly royalty, rule or realm in the Hebrew. The word heaven that we read in English, uh, the sky by implication heaven, happiness, power, eternity, and also relating to the gospel. So when you read those words in English, the kingdom of heaven, it's saying the realm of eternity, the realm of happiness, the realm of power, the realm of good news. That's what it's actually saying there. I'm sorry, I said Hebrew in the Greek. That's what it's actually saying there in the Greek. Okay, it's talking about the realm of eternity, the realm of power, the realm of the sky, the realm of happiness, the realm of the gospel. When you see the words kingdom of heaven. Okay, that makes a huge difference. That's why the Bible was written in Hebrew, Greek and Aramaic, because the words, the meanings are so much more broad. So somehow here in the West, we have reduced what the Lord said to going to church. OK, and God has wiped all that out. God has taken his mighty hand and he's wiped out everything, all of our traditions, everything that we were doing that we thought was church life is gone now. We can't do it now. OK, we're online like I am now. We're doing other stuff. But the scripture there does not say going to church. <laughs> it says the realm 
of happiness, the realm of power, the realm of eternity, the realm of the sky. That's what the Lord is talking about when he uses the phrase translated in English, kingdom of heaven. Then he says that it's like a treasure hidden in a field. Okay. Now, what jumps out to me about that is that it being like a treasure hidden in the field is that God hides a lot of things in plain sight. Okay. God hides a lot of things in plain sight. Okay. And that's why you have to walk by faith and not by sight. One day I asked the Lord, if we're supposed to walk by faith and not by sight, why did you give us eyes? And he said, I give you eyes for two reasons. The first reason I gave you eyes is to help you navigate the natural realm, the world around you. And then he said to me, the second reason I gave you eyes was to enjoy the color spectrum. When I painted the world, I painted it with a very broad color palette and I wanted you to be able to see that and enjoy that. And then God said this, he said, but I never put the reality of a thing in the visual. God said he never put the reality of a thing in the visual. And that's why you have creatures on the bottom of the ocean floor that look like rock, look like coral, look like something else. And when you come near them, they spring alive. That's why you have creatures in the jungle that look like trees and look like branches and like chameleons can adapt to whatever color of whatever they're around. But then when you come near them, they spring alive, okay? And that's why you can't just jump up and marry anybody you wanna marry <laughs> because you don't know what's in them. You don't know who somebody is by looking at them, okay? Remember, that's how so many of the people that were alive when Jesus was alive, that's how so many of those people missed him. They missed the Lord because you could not look at Jesus and tell that that was God in the flesh. One more time, you could not look at Jesus and tell that was God in the flesh. Jesus had to be pointed out, okay? At his baptism, he was pointed out, John the Baptist said, behold, the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. Okay, when they were coming to arrest Jesus, when Judas was selling him out, they asked Judas, how are we gonna know which one is him? Okay, uh, Judas said, the one that I give a kiss to, that's him. That means the Lord looked like the rabbis of his day. He was indistinguishable. Also, Jesus asked his friends one day, who do people say that I am? He said, some saying that you're Elias, some saying that you're John the Baptist raised from the dead. And then Jesus said, who do you say I am? Then Peter said, thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. And then Jesus said, flesh and blood hath not revealed that to you, Peter, but my father, which is in heaven. So in other words, you couldn't look. Peter didn't look at Jesus and figure that out. That was by revelation. Okay. So God does not put the reality of a thing in the visual. And that's very, very key to the next scripture I'm going to read. Very, very key that you get out of the mindset of thinking that the treasures that God gives you, when God makes a promise about treasure, that they're going to look the way you think they should look, that they're going to be what you think that they are, that they're going to come from the direction or the area that you think. Because when we imagine stuff, we get a picture, we get a movie playing in our head. But what I've discovered about God's promises is, is that God will bring his word to pass, but it might not look <laughs> like you thought it was going to look. It might not come the way you thought it was going to come. It might not be what you thought it was going to be. OK, what's well, a real life example of that? George Washington Carver. You couldn't look at the peanut with your natural eye and tell all of those products and all that potential was in the peanut. But George Washington Carver got alone with the Holy Ghost and the Spirit of God opened up the treasures, the mystery, the hidden things about the peanut and gave him all those inventions. Can you see that? So that's Matthew 13, 44. That's all I wanna talk about there. If you wanna hear uh, the rest of my teaching in terms of the context of the kingdom of heaven, then uh, I have a no more genies on it, so go check that out. But now I wanna look at the next scripture. And that is Isaiah 45 and three. Let me put that on the screen. Isaiah 45 and three. Isaiah 45 and three. Now, Isaiah is one of the major prophets of the Old Testament. Here's Vanita. Let me say hey to Sister Vanita. 
Amen. Isaiah is one of the major prophets of the Old Testament. Now, I've told you, you've heard, if you follow me at all, you've heard me say it many times that major prophet and minor prophet, those terms do not mean that their message was more or less important. It just means that their books were longer or shorter. So when you're reading the minor prophets, Nahum, Zephaniah, Zechariah, Habakkuk, Haggai, Malachi, their books are anywhere from uh, Jonah, their books are anywhere from three to five, maybe six chapters at most. When you read Jeremiah, Isaiah, Daniel, their books are over 60 chapters long. Okay, so they had a lot more to say, or a lot more at least that's recorded in scripture. That's what it means by major prophet and minor prophet. It does not mean that their messages were not important. And when you come on the video, please like and share, because you know when a prophetic word goes forth, we want as many people as possible to hear it, okay? So the spirit of God can speak to as many saints and so he can challenge unbelievers. So when you read Isaiah, Isaiah is a major prophet in the Old Testament, but it does not mean that the minor prophet's message was less important. So we're gonna read Isaiah 45 and three. New International Version, I will give you hidden treasures, riches stored in secret places so that you may know that I am the Lord, the God of Israel, who summons you by name. New Living Translation, and I will give you treasures hidden in the darkness, secret riches. I will do this so you may know that I am the Lord, the God of Israel, the one who calls you by name. English Standard Version, I will give you the treasures of darkness and the hordes in secret places that you may know that it is I, the Lord, the God of Israel, who call you by your name. Berean Study Bible, I will give you the treasures of darkness and the hidden riches of secret places so that you may know that I am the Lord, the God of Israel, who calls you by name. You didn't know that hoarding was in the Bible, did you? The English Standard Version said, I will give you the treasures of darkness and the hordes in secret places, okay? So what does it mean to hoard up? What does it mean to store up? Hoarding up, storing up. You've seen that TV show Hoarder. You you know about hoarders. What does that mean? It means you got so much stuff in your house, you can hardly move around in there. You hardly have room to function. And that's what God is saying, the amount of treasure he wants to give you. But what is it that the Holy Ghost wants to reveal to us today about how we apply this to our lives today? Here it is. The Spirit of God is saying that right now, some of us are poised to receive this kind and this level of treasure from God. But we have to get our clues from the scriptures. <clears throat> One time when I was very young, <clears throat> my father asked me, because uh, I had my two children, my son and my daughter, my father asked me, how much would you give for your children. I was like, nothing. He said, I don't want to get nothing for my kids. We're not training for nothing. And then my father said, then you're already a rich man, aren't you? Okay. So sometimes we don't understand that our children, our seed, our offspring, our legacy, okay, are hidden treasures. You have to take a baby from infancy and turn that baby into a fully functioning human being. Okay. And that's an investment, but the payoff, the way that the world is blessed, the way that you are blessed, the way that generations to come, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, the way that generations to come are blessed because of your children. That's an example of hidden treasure. You can't see all that in when the child is an embryo growing in the mother's womb. You can't see all that when a child uh, is an infant you're holding in your hand. But if you invest in that child, they will grow up and bless the world. They will bless people that you won't live to see. They will bless your family in ways that you won't live to see. That's a treasure that rolls from generation to generation. That's an example of hidden treasure, hidden treasure. But let's look at the scripture again. Hey, God bless you, Sister Victoria. God bless you. God says, I will give you hidden treasures. Berean Study Bible says the treasures Okay, it says treasure store, a treasury, a storehouse of darkness. Okay, 
Now that word dark is intense. It says dark darkens misery, destruction, death, ignorance, sorrow, and wickedness. Now, now wait a minute. <laughs> wait a minute. Now, what's God talking about in the Hebrew? Dark darkness, misery, destruction, death, ignorance, sorrow, and wickedness. Do you know what that means? That is a version of Romans 8 and 28. What God is saying there to us is that when you are going through things that are dark or destructive or the enemy is trying to bring you misery or the enemy is trying to bring death uh, onto your life, God will reach into that situation and bring treasures to the forefront. Haven't you ever noticed that when you come out of a trial, uh, especially if it was an intense trial, an intense trial or intense tribulation, intense trouble, have you ever noticed that you're better as a Christian, that you're be a better person, that you pray more, that your faith has increased, that you've learned how to take down some of your pride and ask for help when you need it, that you've learned how to be honest about how you feel, that you've learned how to be, says Victoria on Periscope says, yes, that you've learned how to be more disciplined, that you've learned how to not take what God has already given you for granted. Haven't you ever noticed that when you come through something as a believer, I'm not talking about unbelievers, I'm talking about as a believer, when you come through something, haven't you ever noticed that you are better? That is one of the hidden treasures that God gives us that unbelievers don't have. God brings some things out of you. So even though the enemy or the circumstance was trying to bring darkness, destruction, misery, and death, ignorance into your life. Now, there's a difference between ignorant and ignorant. Ignorant means you don't know. Ignant means that you don't know. You proud that you don't know, and you don't want anybody else to know. Ignorant is a different level than ignorant, okay? So... Whenever you are dealing with something like that, if you notice, by the time God gets through Romans 8 and 28 and, it, and polishing you, you're a different person. You will, in fact, be so much of a different person until you won't remember who you were before the trial. Do you understand that's a hidden treasure? Do you understand that there was some gold inside of you? that maybe you didn't know was there? Did you know that there was some potential inside of you that you didn't know was there? And even though the devil came to try to keep you in darkness, to try to crush you, to try to bring death and destruction in your life, by the time God got through with it, he brought you up to a higher level. Think about it. Think about how nothing makes you pray like trouble. Think about it. Think about those of you that know how to pray in tongues and pray in a prayer language. Now that's not the same thing. Tongues in a prayer language. Now a prayer language is a subset of tongues, but that's not all it means to pray in tongues because the miracle of Pentecost was not prayer language. The miracle of Pentecost was that everybody listening heard what they were saying in their own language. So it was actually kind of a reverse tower of Babel. It was actually a situation where the spirit of God was translating into different languages as people were speaking. That's not the same as prayer language. But those of you that have a prayer language, did you know that there's a level you can pray in tongues where you pray until the Holy Ghost takes over? When the Holy Ghost takes over, you can tell when his voice has come to the forefront. It's totally different. The Spirit of God will say things that you wouldn't think to say, because remember, the Spirit of God is the only one that knows what's in the Father and what's in the Son. And when you have developed your prayer language to the point where you can pray in tongues, to where the Spirit of God literally takes over your mouth. He'll begin to confess things. He'll begin to say things that you never even knew were there. And I remember the first time I did that, the first time I experienced that on that new level. You know how I was open to receive that teaching? Because I was in trouble. <laughs> That's why. And I needed a word from the Lord. And I heard a prophet talk to me about the, the secret and the key was going to be learning how to pray in tongues at a new level and letting the Holy Ghost take over. And I'm telling you, I felt it when the Spirit of God took a sentence, a sentence. I felt it when the Holy Ghost took my mind. Because I was saying stuff I wouldn't even think to say, stuff I wouldn't even know, stuff I wouldn't even know. Because there is treasure in your spirit and it's hidden. 
That's one of the reasons that God hides so many things in our spirit and then seals it with the Holy Ghost because the devil can't get to that. But there's a lot of stuff in there that you don't know is there. And so that's why a lot of people that haven't developed their prayer language to that point don't understand that some people are praying about stuff that God answered you about years ago. And the Holy Ghost is trying to get you to another level to pray about some new stuff because God already answered that. God already answered. And some of y'all got that same prayer list and you've been reading off that prayer list in a very religious way. But that's because you're only praying in your native language. You haven't learned yet the secret to praying in tongues. Because when you pray in tongues, if you pray long enough and you learn how to surrender, the spirit of God comes to the forefront from your spirit. It's the most amazing thing and takes over and takes what you're saying to a whole new level and will reveal to you in the prayer things that you didn't know. And you know how the scripture says, we know not how to pray. We know, uh, you know, we don't know what to pray for all that. That's really true. That's another reason that you have to learn how to pray in tongues and let the Holy Ghost take over because then the spirit of God will show you what you need to be praying for. Did you know that? It's a completely different level. That's another example of what I mean about hidden treasures. Stuff in you as a believer that you didn't even know was there. That's the difference between religion and relationship because religious people, they're all religious. They got their list and I pray for this every day. That's good. Nothing wrong with that. Nothing wrong with that. But have you ever prayed in tongues long enough to let the Holy Ghost show you what Father in heaven and Jesus have already heard and answered and how you need to move forward and pray about some other stuff? Okay, that's another example. Let's keep going. I will give you the treasures of darkness. Uh, in English, it says treasures hidden in darkness. In Hebrew, it says what I just told you, darkness, meaning misery, destruction, death, ignorance, sorrow, and wickedness. That means when wicked people are coming in your life trying to do wicked things, God's going to pull treasure out of that situation. How does God do that? I don't know. He's God. What I do know is that if it's in the word, it's going to come to pass, but you have to believe it. Okay? When you're dealing with sorrow, there's a, a, a whole bunch of things that on the surface look like they was the wrong thing. Like, for example, breaking up with somebody. If you ever broke up with someone that you really loved, that is not easy. If for whatever reason it didn't work out, that is one of the most difficult things in the world you are ever going to go through. Did you know that in that sorrow, God could bring treasure out of that sorrow? Do you know why? Because maybe that wasn't the right one for you. Maybe that person, if y'all had stayed together, maybe the life that you would have built would not have been all that God wanted you to have. Let me tell you something about the Lord. The Lord has no limits. God doesn't have like a ceiling, like he doesn't have a roof. God doesn't have a place in him where you can hit a plateau and God says, well, that's all I got. <laughs> that does not exist in God. So if the Lord was a house, if you walked inside of the Lord, if he was a house and you started walking up the steps, you would never reach the top. OK, I know that's difficult to imagine because you have to stop thinking in three dimensions. You have to stop thinking in the natural. OK, because it's different in the spirit. So if you were to, again, walk into Christ as if he were a house, if you got on the steps, you would literally go from level to level to level to level forever. And you never reach the top. You would never reach the end of Jesus. You'd never reach the end of God. Why do I bring that up in the context of relationships? I'll tell you why. Because God is the only one that knows all the days of your life. And I stopped by to tell you prophetically and personally, what I know is that, is that if you are not with the right person, you are never going to realize all of your potential. Did you know that the wrong person will kind of make a point of keeping you from realizing your potential. That's the danger of wrong relationships. And some people have not gotten to where God wanted you to get because of a relationship. Why do you think so many prophets in the Bible were single? Why do you think so many, so many people in the New Testament that did great things for the Lord? Why do you think so many of the people stay single? 
<clears throat> if you get the right person and if the right person is spirit filled like you are and they love the Lord and they love the word and they're surrendered and they're on the cross every day and they learn how to say not will, not my will, but thine be done, then maybe you have a chance that y'all can lift each other up like you're supposed to. But I'm sad to say many times relationships like that are the exception and not the rule. And many times people are carnal or they're just the wrong person for you. And God looked down into your future and God knew that had you stayed with them, you would have never become everything you're supposed to be in this life. I'm just going to let that sink in. So that's what I mean when I say, even when the scripture says, even in sorrow, even in sorrow, you broke up with him and you cried. You cried every day for a month. You cried. You cried. Your heart hurt. You cried. You didn't want to let him go. And it was a sorrowful day from your point of view. But from the Lord's point of view, he looked two years into the future and said, I need to get them here. And there's no way they're going to get there if they stay with that person. Can you see that? That's another example of how even in the midst of sorrow, I'll give you one more, then I'll move on. Some of y'all, uh, there's uh, this young man that I know who lost his mom very, very early. I'm not sure if she died in childbirth. I know that he was very, very young when his mother died. And recently he got married and he and his wife had their first child. Well, I think she did die in childbirth because all while his wife was in labor and delivery, he was holding his breath. You could, you could see it. He posted a picture. You could see, you could see the trepidation. But I stopped by to tell you that the Lord gave me a revelation on that whole situation. The Lord told me that he is now going to love his wife and his daughter with a depth of love that he never would have had if his mother hadn't died. Now, not that God caused his mother's death. No, that's not the Lord. That's sin and death. But since it happened, God can use what happened. And God broke open this young man's heart in a way that his heart would have never opened. Because what happens when you have everybody around you your whole life? It's very easy to take them for granted. Very, very easy to take them for granted. You know how I know that? Now I'm overgeneralizing. I know I'm overgeneralizing. I know I'm overgeneralizing. So you don't have to tell me that. But I want you to notice something. I want you to notice that people that have been loved and comfortable their whole life, folks like that generally don't praise God like they're crazy. It's broken people. It's people that's been rejected by your mama, by your daddy. It's people that have been through something, people where it didn't nobody like you, like King David, where it didn't nobody believe in King David but God. Did you know that? Nobody believed in David but God. When Samuel came to anoint uh, the next king, Jesse called all his sons but David. Samuel said, well, surely this tall, good looking one is the next king. God was like, nope. When David went to the front lines, they said, what you doing here? And David was like, what have I done now? I'm just bringing y'all some lunch. And David ended up killing Goliath. Nobody believed in David but God. Did you know that? That's why David praised God like he was crazy. Because David knew God took me from tending the sheep to being king over Israel. And David said, I'm going to give him the glory if it's the last thing I do. And if I got to come out my clothes and be more base and more vile in my own sight, I'm going to praise the God of Israel because I wasn't nothing but a shepherd boy and he put made me king of all these people. You see that? Because I'm overgeneralizing, but generally people that are loved their whole life, people that are loved by mom and daddy from the time they're little, generally, I'm overgeneralizing, people that have had their family around, you know, all these big families, people that have been comfortable their whole life. People like that generally don't praise God like they're crazy. Have you noticed that? Don't nobody praise God but sinners. Where you know if it wasn't for the Lord on your side, you would have been dead a long time ago. You know that in your darkest hour, when you was losing your sanity, Jesus came and held your mind up. You know when the doctor said something was in your body, making your body fall apart, and you felt God come inside your body and knit your body back together. Because you know you made mistakes and the mercy of God, God slid his hand of mercy underneath your life and stopped that mistake from being your destruction. Because don't nobody praise God but sinners. And don't nobody praise God said folks that been through something. Okay? 
So I know I'm overgeneralizing, but generally speaking, I just want you to think about if you've ever had any time in church, if you've ever been in a worship service, I want you to think about the people that praise God like they're crazy. It's generally, it ain't the comfortable folks. It ain't folks that have money their whole life. It ain't folks that's been loved their whole life. Generally, generally speaking, okay? See, so that's another example of what I mean about, like when I started off talking about that young man about how God can break open a treasure in your heart that wouldn't have happened any other way. Okay, I myself, me and my son, we're fire survivors. I don't know if I ever gave you my testimony about surviving a fire, I don't have time to do it now, but I'm a fire survivor, but you can't look at me, you can't look at either one of us and tell that we've been through a fire. I mean, flames all around me, flames up 13 feet high, this close to me, and there's not a scratch on me, okay? When you come that close to death, it changes you. And whatever kind of, Whatever kind of mess, whatever was in your life before, you cut all that out. You ain't got time for that no more, okay? When you come that close to death, when you are a fire survivor. I had experience, an experience that wasn't that different from Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. It's not Abednego, it's Abednego. I had an experience that wasn't that different from that because, because if things hadn't happened the way they did, I would have died. I would have died just from the smoke inhalation because I didn't even know the fire was in my apartment. And I open my door and it's flames 13 feet. And I mean, this cold, I mean, right, I'm looking at the walls on fire. Have you ever seen fire crawl up a wall? I, I can't explain it. It's something you have to see. And there's a smell that's unmistakable. I'll never forget that smell. Okay. You can't look at me and tell that I've been through that. You know why? Because I, me and my son, because I got out of that without a scratch on me, nobody in the apartment building died. Okay, we had people that was coming out 20 minutes after we did. We had people coming out with nothing but a sheet wrapped around them where one of the supports of the building caved in on their bed and they came out, husband, wife, and the baby. That's what I'm trying to tell you. That's what I'm trying to tell you. When you've been through stuff like that, that's why you're going to praise God like you crazy because you're going to thank him because you know every day is a gift. And it's just not the same with people that's been comfortable all the time all the time. So even in the midst of your sorrow, God is at work pulling some treasure out, okay? And then it says the hidden riches and the hidden riches uh, coming out of the Hebrew, it says a secret storehouse, a secreted valuable money. Stop right there. God said, I'm gonna give you some stuff that's in a secret storehouse. I'm gonna give you secret storehouses. God says, I'm going to give you something, a secret and valuable. That's like, like if, if, if your mother had a wedding ring that's been in the family for generations, that's not just laying out somewhere. That's somewhere in a box somewhere. Okay. A secret and valuable. And then it says money. So God said, I'm going to give you secret storehouses. I'm going to give you secret and valuables and I'm going to give you money. Okay. Hidden riches are secret places, a secret place, a hiding place. Now, why is that important? I'll tell you why. That's important because the Holy Ghost wants us to know that there's some stuff that other people aren't going to see. Now, see, this leads me into something else that, that this is going to be deep and intense. But hear me. People don't understand that God can hide himself and God can hide his hand. <clears throat> when the son of God turned himself into Jesus Christ and came through the womb of a woman, there were people that were alive in Jerusalem at the time, but you could not look at Jesus and tell who he was. There are some people, can you imagine how salty you would have to feel after you die? to know that you were on earth in the same city as Messiah and you didn't recognize him and you didn't believe in him. Because remember, God becoming a man was not once in a lifetime. It wasn't even once in a generation. It was once in all creation. That There's only one time God ever did that. He never did that before and he's never gonna do that again. In the Old Testament, God appeared to man in different forms. In the New Testament, God manifested himself through Mary's womb by becoming human like we are. And he's never going to do that again. 
That was literally a once in all creation experience. And some people got to look at Jesus with a natural eye. They got to look at him like you're looking at me now. And some folks didn't believe. Can you imagine how salty they must have felt after they died because they saw Jesus again? Can you imagine being one of the Roman soldiers that literally nailed him to the cross, that literally took a hammer and took his hand and put that spike in his hand and nailed him to the cross and put that spike in the other hand, nailed him to the cross, put them spikes in his feet, nailed him to the cross. And one of the soldiers stuck that spear in his side and blood and water came out. Okay, after them soldiers died, they saw the Lord again. They saw the Lord in his resurrected form. They saw him after they died. And they realized that they pierced the very son of God. I'm just going to let that sink in. Why am I saying that? I'm saying that, that, and then I'm going to say this a little bit <clears throat> to connect it. If you're familiar with the Mount of Transfiguration, if you read the scriptures, you know what that is. If not, I'll just give you a quick, quick uh, info. The Mount of Transfiguration was where the Lord was alone with Peter, James, and John, because the Lord had his 12, but the Lord had his three inside of his 12 that he went more places with, that hung out with Jesus more, that he was tighter with. As a matter of fact, <clears throat> Apostle John was the one that Jesus gave his mother to when he was down on the cross. Jesus wanted to be sure that Mary was taken care of, and Jesus, as the eldest son, it was his responsibility to make sure his mom was taken care of. So Jesus gave Mary to John, Apostle John the one that both wrote the book of God, John and first, second, and third John and the book of Revelation. That John was Jesus's best friend on earth. So he gave Mary to John and John to Mary. On the Mount of Transfiguration, Peter, James, and John were there. And what happened, long story short, was that Moses and Elijah walked out of the invisible spiritual realm and they were talking to the Lord and Peter, James, and John saw it. They saw it. They saw Moses come out of wherever he was. Because remember, Moses had been dead for thousands of years. They saw Moses come out of wherever he was. And they saw Elijah. Because remember, when Elijah died, he didn't really die. He got in a chariot of fire and went up to heaven. So Elijah didn't have a grave. Remember that the way Elijah's life is booking it in the Bible. We don't know where Elijah came from because he shows up in 1 Kings 17. And the first thing he does is prophesy, there ain't going to be no rain till I say so. And when Elijah leaves, he leaves by a chariot of fire. We have no idea about Elijah's birth and he didn't die. He didn't leave a corpse. Elijah didn't have a grave. He came out of the invisible and they were talking to Jesus, one on his right hand, one on his left. And Peter, James, and John saw it. And John said, we saw the Lord's clothes turn colors. He said, we saw his robe turn into a white that was so white, it's a white we don't have on earth. He said it was so white until John said, if we washed it with fuller soap, if we washed it with, with uh, their equivalent of be a bleach, the deepest cleans cleansing agent that they had in their time, disciple John, apostle John said, we could not achieve that white. So the Lord revealed some of what was in his spirit with that white raiment. And he's talking to Moses and Elijah and Peter, James and John saw that. <clears throat> I wanna point out to you that the other nine didn't. Because everybody is not going to see everything. Why is that important to what I'm saying? I'll tell you why. Because there's some stuff God's going to show you that you don't need to be running your mouth about. That was Joseph's mistake. Remember that the Lord gave Joseph a vision at the age of 17 that one day he was going to be lifted up and that his brother and his uh, brothers and his father were gonna bow down before him. But then Joseph went back and told them what God showed him. Oh Lord, that was a mistake. That was a young boy mistake right there. Running his mouth. And then they hated him so much, they ended up selling him into slavery. Now, once again, God was at work. But the point I'm trying to make is that Joseph might've avoided all that stuff he went through in the life. He just kept his mouth shut. Just let God bring the vision to pass. You don't have to go doing that. See, there's some stuff <clears throat> that God is about to show some of his children that you don't need to be running your mouth about. Do you know that's one of the first things you have to learn in the prophetic? When you are first learning how to walk in the prophetic and when you are first learning, if you are called to the office of a prophet, you can't be blurting out everything that you see. Did you know that? You can't be saying everything that you see because everybody can't handle everything and everything is not for everybody. Now, 
I've discovered that offends people and makes them angry. And my response to that is, be angry. <laughs> Whatever God shows me, I'm going with it. I'm not going to argue with the Lord. You argue with him. I ain't arguing with him. If there's something he wants to show me, fine, I'll take it. But when God is talking about showing us hidden treasures in secret places, there's some stuff that other folks can't, they can't handle it. You might find yourself in a Joseph situation if you go back and run your mouth. So when God begins to reveal these secret things to you, don't say anything unless the Lord tells you to say anything in some circumstances, in some cases. Another dimension of what the Holy Ghost wants us to know from this prophetic word is that <clears throat> a lot of it's not going to look like what you thought. Don't you know that a lot of people have missed their spouses because they didn't look like what you thought? I am now firmly convinced that God answers every prayer that's prayed in faith because the Bible says he does. But I also know that sometimes the answer is walking around inside the skin of somebody that you would never talk to. Did you know that? Did you know that there are some people in this world that want to bless you, but because they are part of a certain group, you would never speak to them? So there's a whole dimension of opportunities that you are not walking in because you you don't have anything to do with those people. Let me give you an example. One of the prime examples of what I'm talking about is people that don't honor the prophetic. I don't care what people say. I care what the Lord says. And the Lord said five, people say three. What'd you say, Prophet Taylor? I said, the Lord said five, people say three. What are you talking about? God said apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, and teacher. He said five, like your four fingers and a thumb on your hand. People say, no, we just take the evangelists, the pastors, and the teachers. Ain't no modern day apostles, false. Ain't no modern day prophets, false. The whole Bible is apostolic and prophetic. The whole Bible was written by apostles and prophets. And apostles and prophets are real today. But I have met plenty of people in my life who are like, well, we don't believe in all that. I have met people that have let their children die because they wouldn't receive a prophetic word. I'm going to say that one more time. I have met people, I'm not making that up. I'm not going to call their name, but I'm not making that up. I have met people that would rather let their children die than hear what thus saith the Lord from the mouth of a prophet. And it don't have to be from someone in the office of a prophet. It could be someone that flows in a prophetic gift. It's not about that. It's not about a title. It's not about the vehicle that God uses. It's about hearing what the Spirit is saying to the church. That's one of the prime examples of people that have cut off. How do you think we're going to navigate through 2020? Ain't but one way, and it's through the prophetic. The Lord has to reveal to us what to do next. Why do you think so many Christians are just don't know what to do? Because they don't walk in the prophetic. They don't want to hear it. They're like, if it doesn't come from an evangelist, pastor, or teacher, then that ain't God. And wrong again. How do you think we're going to make it through the rest of this year? That's going to be through the apostolic and the prophetic. God going to have to tell us what to do. Sometimes the Lord has to tell you, like, when to go to the grocery store during the pandemic, the Lord will be like, don't leave the house now. The Lord will be like, Lord will be like go now and come straight back home. Stuff like that. Yes, the Holy Ghost can lead you on that level. Sometimes the Holy Ghost can be like, don't go down that street, go down this street. Sometimes the Holy Ghost can be like, wait 20 minutes. Just all kinds of things because they that are led by what? The Spirit of God. They are the sons of God. That's scripture. And when you're dealing in a time that we're in now, we are in a time like unto Sodom and Gomorrah. We are in a time like unto the days of Noah. OK, where much flesh. Now, God said in the days of Noah, the end of all flesh has come before me. But we are in a time where the end of much flesh has come before God. Much flesh is ending. That's the time you in right now. And the only way you're going to make it through that kind of time is through the prophetic, through asking the spirit of God. What's the <clears throat> what's the agenda for today? What should I do? What should I not do? What should I leave alone? What should, what should I do? 
And if you're one of those people, if you grew up in one of those religious denominations, one of those situations where they told you that apostles and prophets are only in the Bible and they're not real now, fail. <clears throat> you heard me say it last week and I'm going to say it here again. Some of y'all looking at me are never going to shake your pastor's hand again. Did you know that? Now, if you went to a giant church, you probably had no chance shaking your pastor's hand anyway. But some of y'all went to you know, medium-sized churches. Some people go to small, very intimate churches, but the congregation is really close. Did you know some of y'all are never gonna shake your pastor's hand again? You are never gonna shake his hand again. So what you gonna do? What you gonna do? If pastor's not online, or if he is online, or if you're not online, or if the internet went down, what would you do? <clears throat> right, you need to know the Lord for yourself. That's the point. That's the point I'm trying to make is that you need to know the Lord for yourself. You need to know the voice of Christ for yourself because the Lord said, my sheep know my voice. And if you don't know the Lord for yourself during this time, it's literally the easiest thing in the world during this time, excuse me, <clears throat> to make a wrong turn because you didn't bother that to ask the Lord, I need you to guide me today. You know where the danger is. You know where the trouble is. You know, and I don't. <clears throat> which is why he told us to walk by faith and not by sight. So you've got to tell me, how do I order my steps? You see all them scriptures we've been reading and all them songs we've been singing, all them years, order my steps in your word, dear Lord. It can't just be lip service. That's one of my favorite songs. I love that song, order my steps in your word, dear Lord. That's a beautiful, beautiful tune. But it can't just be this right here. You have come to a time where that got to be real in your life or you might die. You understand that? Do you understand that you have got to be surrendering to the leading of the Holy Spirit every day? And you got to claim Psalm 91 over your family. I claim it every day over me and mine, me and my children, every day. Do you understand? So the Lord said that he was going to give us secret storehouses, secret valuables, and money money that's in secret places, money that's in secret places, money, yes, right, Sister Victoria, it's serious. I realized that this week, that's right, it is serious. Money that's in secret places, what does that mean? That could mean a variety of things and I don't wanna limit to Lord. But one thing I will say is ideas. Ideas live in the spirit realm and then the spirit of God bursts a burst of inspiration in your spirit and then it comes to your mind. And then your mind begins to use what your mind has, which is imagination. And it begins to paint a picture. And uh, that kind of inspiration that can only come from God, God can give you an invention. God can give you some stuff that the world needs that the world has never seen before. <clears throat> you want a, a real live example of that? Mm -hmm. If you were around in the 80s and 90s, in the 80s is when CDs came out and music went digital. Music turned into ones and zeros. It turned into binary code. It turns turned into language that computers can read. Because before music went digital, before we had CDs, music was on vinyl. And vinyl was basically one long cut into a record. And music was on tape, OK? Magnetized particles on the tape filament. Then music turned digital, turned binary, ones and zeros. And we had CDs and all of a sudden we had music that we could copy with no loss of quality. Because when you made a tape of a tape of a tape, so much hiss, by the time you got to the second or third copy, it wasn't worth nothing. But when music became binary, digital, you can make copy after copy after copy with no loss of quality. Well, all through the 80s, if you wanted to buy a CD, they were charging 15, 17, 19, 20 dollars. And normally one but three songs on that CD that you like. One but three songs, but they were charging you 20 dollars for the three songs that you wanted. And the mother 17 was filler. In the 90s, guess what happened? The rise of the internet happened, and a company came along that wasn't and still isn't in the record industry and said, we're going to give consumers a chance to buy songs one track at a time. What company was that? That will be Apple Computer. They are not in the record industry. They are not in the music industry. They still ain't in the music industry. Apple's not a music industry company, they're a computer company. But they came up with the idea of digital downloads. That's why iTunes is still, to this day, it's 2020. So we're talking, you know, 30, 40 years, well, 30 years. iTunes to this day is still the number one place for digital 
downloads. Now, the, the most researched place besides Google is obviously YouTube. People want to see a video. But in terms of digital downloads that people are going to pay for, it's still iTunes, created by a company that wasn't in the record industry. Because somebody had an idea that we're going to deliver tracks one at a time to consumers instead of making them buy a whole CD, paying $20 for three songs. We're going to make them pay 99 cents for one song and they can get songs at their convenience. Completely changed everything. Completely changed everything. That's an example of a, a hidden treasure in hidden darkness that produced money. Can you see it? Can you see that? That's what God, as a matter of fact, I'm supposed to breathe it out. I'm supposed to breathe it out on you. That's what God, I release the spirit of hidden treasure. I release the spirit of hidden secret places, secret valuables, and money on all that will believe and receive it. And in the days to come, yea, even this day, the spirit of God is going to show you some stuff to produce things from hidden places, hidden treasures. Wow, says the spirit of the living God. Wow, I receive that. Amen and amen. See, so that's what I mean. People that don't want to walk in a prophetic don't know what I'm talking about. They don't understand prophetic movement. They don't want to understand prophetic utterances. They don't understand that there's a corresponding movement in the natural to, to recognize a truth in the spiritual. Why do you think God had them break pictures, sometimes in the Old Testament, or sometimes they would march around the city, or sometimes they would shout? Why do you think God had them do that? He was having them do something in the natural that was reflective of what was going on in the spiritual. When he had a march around the city, what was God doing in the spirit? He was putting the angels around the city. He, the Lord of hosts was lining up a host. So as his children walked around, the angels were coming around. That's called prophetic movement, if you didn't know that. Now, do you see how people who reject the prophetic outright don't even know how to tap into that dimension of God? So when a prophet, remember that when Jesus said to them, he said, receive ye the Holy Ghost, and he, he breathed on them. So prophetically, when I, when I breathe it out, that means God wants you to receive that in your spirit, not your mind, it's deeper than your mind. He's going to show you some secret stuff that you couldn't see any other way but by the Holy Ghost. All right, let me be sure that's all the Holy Ghost wants me to say. So, so that you may know that I am the Lord, the God of Israel, who calls you by name. Okay, calls you by name. That's indicative of a relationship and not religion. That's why religious people can't get this. Religious people, in fact, hate the Holy Ghost. Did you know that religious people hate the Holy Ghost? Just go, well, back when we had church, just go to some super religious church and start praising God and start speaking in tongues. Watch what, watch what happens. Watch what they do to you. Religious people hate the Holy Ghost. Religious people want control. They want to be in control. They want to, they want to order the service. They don't want to uh, give the spirit of God reign and let him have his way. Okay? And so the Lord just released a word that there is money that you can't see with your natural eye, that only the Holy Ghost can show you. Who wouldn't want that? Why would you not want that in these times? There's treasure that God has put somewhere that's not discernible with these right here, that God has to show you. Why would you not want that? See what I mean? All right, that's our prophetic word for today. Thank you uh, so much to those of you that tuned in to watch me live. Uh, that word blessed my heart. I received it. Uh, I'm going to walk in it. Remember I told you, you got to believe it, receive it, say it and obey it. And that's what I'm going to do. <laughs> and I'm looking for the Lord to show me all of that. Uh, and remember, don't be running your mouth about what God shows you, what God shows you is for you. Don't be running your mouth unless the Lord tells you to. If the Lord tells you to share it with someone, then share it. But other than that, don't be running your mouth. They're going to do you like Joseph. Everybody can't handle it. Some people are going to get jealous of you, okay, and sell you out, try to throw you in jail, try to do evil things to you, okay? Don't be running your mouth. Amen. God bless you, Sister Victoria. So thank you again to those of you on Periscope uh, that watch me live, those of you that watch me live on Facebook. Remember, you can always watch the replay on Periscope and Facebook Live, but also the YouTube video. Now, I use a new format on the videos now on YouTube, so definitely check that out. And the scriptures are on the screen because I want you to look up the word of God for yourself. You need to read the scriptures for yourself. I 
keep emphasizing that over and over and over and over again, that you need to read the word for yourself because you in a time where you better know the voice of the Lord for yourself because it's literally life and death. All right. So amen. God bless. Um, man, August, last day of August is tomorrow. Can you believe that? So, okay. There's going to be some new stuff in September. There's going to be some new stuff in September. So whatever the Lord is going to show you over these next two days, finish August's business. Whatever August business you have with Christ, finish it in these next two days. Because when September 1st hit, it's going to be, be some new revelation. It's going to be, uh, I'm seeing it. It's going to be a whole new dimension. As the leaves begin to turn golden brown and orange and yellow and copper, there's going to be some new stuff that the Holy Ghost is doing. It's going to be some new revelation. So that's what I mean when I say finish your business with God these last two days of August. And we're going to turn the corner into the new season. And we got to get ready for the next thing. We got to get ready for the next thing. That's the difference between relationship and religion. When the Lord says, uh, in three days, I'm going to be here. Those that have relationships say, yes, sir. We want to be like the wise virgins. And when the bridegroom shows up, we are ready to go. The foolish virgins are not filled with the Holy Ghost. They're off somewhere trying to buy the Holy Ghost at, at, at Walmart or Aldi, and they're going to miss the Lord. Don't be like the foolish virgins. Stay full of the Holy Ghost. And when the Lord said, in three days, I'm going to show up and do this, you can be ready. Okay? So. I will be here uh, same time next week, uh, Sunday, 2.30 p.m. Central Standard Time. Don't forget to like and share uh, this video because we want as many people as possible, as many saints to be blessed by this word and as many sinners and unbelievers to be challenged to turn from their way of living to the Christ. Uh, my uh, third quarter prophetic devotional is out. We got one more month, month and then now I want you to get on my newsletter list because I do advertising. Sometimes there's discounts. Uh, there's free stuff. You get, you know, first shot at a bunch of things because the fourth quarter prophetic devotion is going to drop uh, first of October. So get on my uh, email list if you want to know how to do that. Now, I don't send out spam because I hate spam. So I don't, I don't do spam. I send out a weekly newsletter. It's on my Facebook live page uh, at the at the top where it says sign up, sign up for my weekly newsletter and you'll get a weekly newsletter Friday morning. It drops Friday morning at seven o'clock uh, Central Standard Time, seven o'clock a.m. And it has all kinds of uh, things in it to help recap the week and help you take, take into the weekend, but no spam. And then, like I said, still a month left to get your prophetic devotional. And uh, now I don't do what I do for money, but if you want to bless my ministry, you can uh, bless me through Cash App. I put my cash up on the screen um, because uh, several people have asked me how to sow into my ministry. Because remember, whatever ministry you sow into, you get that anointing, that mantle comes in your life. So when you sow in the life of a prophet, your prophetic increases, your visions increase. That will happen every time. If you sow into the ministry of a pastor, your shepherd's heart will increase. If you sow into the ministry of an evangelist, your desire to win lost souls will increase. If you sow into the ministry of someone that's really, really up in years and they're still going for God, then you begin to get a long life anointing. Did you know that? Find yourself a minister, a man or a woman that's been ministering the gospel for decades, and now they're in their 80s and their 90s, and they're still going strong for God and so into their ministry. If you sow into their ministry, then a long life anointing that's on them begins to come on you. Did you know that? That's what happens. See, the kingdom of God is better than the kingdom of the world. That's what happens when you sow into the ministry, the ministry of anybody that's been called, anointed, and appointed by God to minister the word to you. That anointing, that gifting, that mantle that's on them will begin to manifest in your life when you bless them financially. So if you want to bless me financially, uh, let me put that on the screen right quick. Because several people have asked me. So uh, I do want to make that available for those that want to sell. And uh, once again, you know, I don't do this for money. I do this because God called me to do it. OK, but if you want to sow into my ministry, that's how to do it do it in my cash app. And again, I just want to thank you so much. So I'll be back same time next Sunday, 2.30 p.m. Central Standard Time. And uh, remember, this Friday is New Music Friday for him. So I'll be releasing a new hymn this Friday at noon. Uh, that's why you need to get on the newsletter list because the newsletter will remind you of that, that at noon, tune in live on my Facebook Live and on my 150 hymns page. If you didn't know, 
from 150 hymns page and I'll be releasing a new hymn. And then I got all kinds of new gospel music coming out and videos and the whole thing. Okay. So just stay tuned. All right. Amen. God bless. And remember, it's time for some secret hidden treasures in darkness and God is going to reveal them to us starting today. Amen. And amen. God bless. to threaten and sickness is his weapon to fill my days with strife and cutting